for three, two. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Mary Gardner with Lap of Love and today's Facebook Live is about canine arthritis and what you need to know about it. And I thought I'd bring in an expert. And so this is my first person to have back again. On, I, it's not like I'm Oprah or anything special, like having a returning guest, but I thought I would bring back Dr. Kristen Kirkby Shaw, and into our stream. Let me add you into my little stream here. Back again. So welcome. Hey, I'm honored. I didn't realize that that was the case. It's great to see you again. Yes, you're my first repeater. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> there, might be a word, there might be a word for that. Um, but we we talked about laser therapy last month, and uh, and and I just thought. You know, we we spoke so much about arthritis and how lasers can help and how a sissy loop can help with pain and, and inflammation. So we had to just talk about the, you know, the big elephant in the room and talk about canine arthritis mm -hmm. and, and what the heck is it? So, oh boy, we got Rick from Irvine already on the line. Everybody's ready. We got 35 people listening so far and we just got started. So clearly this is a big, a big problem out there, uh, uh, Dr. Shaw. So can you just in general, explain what arthritis is. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and when I talk, when I'm talking to clients, this is the first part that I start discussing because I think it's a word that just gets tossed around, and we assume that dog owners know what it means. So, on the most basic level, arthritis means that there's the joint is abnormal. So, well, then what is a joint? So, the joint is where two bones meet, and the ends of the bones are lined with cartilage. And cartilage is what allows the bone to slip and slide and move without any friction, but also without any pain. Mm -hmm. So another important point is that cartilage, if you imagine it's like this nice white shiny surface to the end of the bone, cartilage doesn't have any nerve endings in it. It doesn't have any pain receptors in it. Okay. So arthritis really is when that cartilage starts to wear away and we talk about, you, you've heard the phrase bone on bone pain. When that happens, that means that now there's these nerve endings that are underneath where the cartilage was. They're now exposed, and pain starts to result. Uh, it is a result of that. Um, as that cartilage starts to wear away, there's all of these secondary changes that happen within the joint, where we have swelling. Um, so we have kind of more fluid that develops in the joint. We have um, atrophy of the muscles around the joint. So there's mm. all those kind of secondary things that set in, but pain is also something that, that obviously starts happening once we have that cartilage start to wear away. I just, I can, in, I can hear my mother saying, I've got bone on bone pain. Like that's the shit <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> all the time. Yeah. And, uh, and, it, and it happens so often. So I know I've got a little stat here to show how many, to, look at you. I see one in five dogs are affected with our well, Actually, that, that honestly is, that's the statistic that's thrown around most often that 20% of dogs have OA or so osteoarthritis is okay. our OA. That's the acronym that you'll hear veterinarians use for general arthritis. Um, actually the statistics, more recent statistics suggest somewhere between 30 and 40% of dogs have arthritis. Um, and that is still probably under diagnosing it. Um, we know that about 50% of dogs at least are overweight and dogs that are overweight have a much greater likelihood of having arthritis. So I tend to think of it probably closer to that 40% of dogs have arthritis. I would probably agree with you. I think we see it at Lap of Love, we see so many dogs, we help so many dogs and I, I want to just anecdotally like a half half have some yeah. kind of yeah. arthritic pain right like and we see the old guys so mm -hmm. when do dogs start getting arthritis yeah so this is um the misconception is that dogs develop or get arthritis when they're older mm -hmm. so there's a big difference between dogs and people when it comes to their type of arthritis so people and actually incidentally cats they tend to get what we call primary arthritis, where it's literally just as you age, it's just wear and tear, your, your joints just start to, to you know, degenerate and, and weaken. This dogs, people and cats. People and cats. So people and cats, okay. and then we have dogs. Dogs typically get what we call secondary arthritis, which means that it is, the arthritis is due to an underlying disorder of the joint that most of the time they were born with. So 
hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, OCD, these genetic conditions that are, are usually should be able to be diagnosed in the dog's first year of life, those are going to cause arthritis. Other causes of arthritis in dogs would be like an ACL tear, or a cranial cruciate ligament tear, um, or a fracture that in, involves a joint. All of those things are the most likely things that are going to eventually lead to, to arthritis. And because of that, we should be able to identify actually dogs when they're young um, or at the time of that cruciate ligament diagnosis and say, all right, we can predict you're going to develop arthritis. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to hear that their puppy um, has hip dysplasia and is then going to get arthritis. But this is the, the when I am talking to veterinarians um, and, and my own clients, the big key is the earlier you diagnose it, the so many more options you have and the the better that dog's life is going to be because you can start intervening early. Okay. So as a veterinarian, when I was in private practice, so how, so you're saying like when they're in there for their six month exam, a so year, I, exam? you know, I actually, um, so there, there are certain breeds that are going to be at greater risk for hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia. Mm -hmm. hip, dysplasia, hip dysplasia in particular, that can actually be diagnosed when dogs are four months old, when they're 16 weeks of age, yeah. by a, a, an exam technique called an Ortolani exam. And that's where the veterinarian manipulates the hip to feel for any looseness in there. Now, that exam technique, usually the dogs need to be a little bit sedated because it's not typically uh, comfortable. Um, but that's the earliest you can start looking for hip dysplasia. So my advice is actually any dog, a uh, Labrador, German Shepherd, Golden Retriever, um, dogs that are genetically at risk to start looking for it at that age. Otherwise, if a dog, say, has elbow dysplasia, they are usually going to start showing some limping in that first year of life. So oh, if, really? Yeah. So if, if, a, if a dog that's less than one year of age comes in with limping, they have a developmental orthopedic disease, meaning a, something that they were born with until proven otherwise. And if it's in the front leg, it's usually the elbow. Um, it can also potentially be the shoulder. Okay, so I'm gonna throw myself under the bus here. Now, I, you know what, because you're my first second timer, I, I really didn't do you like any justice on, on, on explaining how awesome you are. So everybody can see down there the purple, uh, all your letters, which means you're super smart. And, uh, <laughs> boarded in veterinary surgery and reha rehabilitation. So, and, and you were with me at the University of Florida. Well, you would all, you were already going for your, your surgery residency when I was just a wee little uh, uh, student. But I'm gonna throw myself under the bus. I don't think when I, when I graduated, I was comfortable doing this Ortolani. And I don't think, um, or, or should, should, the pet owners ask their veterinarians if they're if they're comfortable with it or should they go see a specialist? So you are not alone. Um, so okay. I I talk about arthritis and, and these things that we're talking about all over the country. The veterinarians, you know, it used to be in person and now it's, it's a lot of Zoom. Um, and most veterinarians don't feel comfortable doing Ortolani exams. And so okay. part of the reason that um, we may talk about the website, but part of the reason I created the the canineanarthritis.org website was to help. Let me put that up there. <laughs> so it's canine arthritis resources and, and education. Um, there is a dog owner section to this website and a veterinarian section where there's videos on how to do an Ortolani exam and the importance of it. And so I do a lot of, of trying to educate because you're definitely not alone. I'd say most of the vets that I talk to feel uncomfortable at orthopedics in general um, and have probably never done an, an Ortolani exam. So do you have to go to specialists? Absolutely not. Um, I would say that most surgeons would love to see a puppy, but they're probably not going to want to take their schedule up just to do an Ortolani exam. Okay. However, we might get into treatment. There is a surgical treatment that can and should be done in dogs that age, um, four to five months of age, that can protect from hip dysplasia or protect from arthritis. Um, but the point is that most general vets should learn to be able to do an ortolani exam um, okay. on dog breeds that are at risk. Okay. So listen, I think this is great for pet owners to know about this website. 
and I want to get back to this more in a little bit for themselves, but, but even to let their vet know about it, if they, yeah. if they don't actually know about it, because yeah. when I was orthopedic, listen, there was a few, there's a few O's that I was scared of orthopedics, <laughs> oncology and optho, like <laughs> the O's that I was like, I felt I need a little bit more, more help with. So, yeah. um, okay. So let's talk about, uh, so let's say, we were able to diagnose based on an exam and they were young enough. What are some things that, what are the, the recommendations that we can do or options if, yeah. if they see these developmental changes or that will happen and turn into arthritis? Yeah, so I, I divide the treatment options into to kind of four quadrants. Um, mm -hmm. One quadrant is pain management. And so if a dog is limping, if a dog, if a veterinarian detects pain, then pain management should be started. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something to talk about with your veterinarian, but it's usually a, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory is usually the first line. Um, then there's, and I've seen there's been some questions about supplements. I know. Um, yeah, so one thing that may happen is you might diagnose hip dysplasia, but there might not be any limping. There may not be any pain. So right. these are things where we wanna be proactive. So you can use oral supplements. There's very, very, very little research supporting supplements. Um, mm. If you're going to use supplements, and I, I think you should do a whole other Facebook Live. I think I will, and I think I know who I'll invite. Um, so the, the keys when you're choosing a supplement are um, make sure that it, the quality control is there because there's no regulatory body telling anybody what they can and can't put, can and cannot put in a supplement. So you want to make sure that it's veterinary and recommended and that they have um, they are comfortable with the quality control that goes into it. So that a vet might be on their advisory board or something like that, looking at their quality control. Yeah. You know, well, that, most, but, most, yeah. Ideally, most ideally, it, it's more about that there's a, a third party lab that's testing the supplement that's saying, okay. oh, that there's nothing that in here that shouldn't be um, or that the, the ingredients meet the label claim. So you want to look for... Um, there's the National Animal Supplement Council, NASC, which is a little yellow, um, little yellow uh, kind of circle, little sticker that will be on the supplement. That's what I look for. For, for oh, we'll post that link. Yeah, Deanna, Deanna's in the background helping me out. She post something. Um, I'm sure. You'll see ones that say GMP, which is Good Manufacturing Pro uh, Practice. Um, you can look at ConsumerLabs.com, but really. For, for me and when I'm talking to veterinarians, I recommend to veterinarians pick two or three supplements that you recommend and you feel comfortable with um, so your client doesn't have to do all of this this research out there. Okay. Yes. Um, so oral supplements are easy, but there's very little research to support most of them. The one falls into a supplement category that does have a lot of research to support it, and I absolutely recommend it for any dog at risk of arthritis or has it, is Adequan. Yeah. Um, so Adequan is given as a shot, so it's given as an injection. Um, I recommend giving it sub-Q. Um, the, the label, the FDA approval for the label is to give it IM intramuscularly, but that's painful. So anybody that's ever had a shot in their arm, it's you're kind of sore for a few days. Um, so I am adamantly opposed to giving it IM. Um, we teach our clients to give it sub-Q uh, at home. Um, so Adequan for sure, ask your vet about that. Okay. So that was, that's the supplement category. Mm -hmm. So that's the supplement category. So the most, the single number one, most important thing to do, there's, you, there's no way that you can over supplement or, or do anything that's going to be more important than making sure the dog doesn't get overweight. Uh -huh. um, so <laughs> on the side of normal. So we want dogs that have any sort of at risk for arthritis or have arthritis. They have to be on the skinny side of normal which means that you should be able to easily feel the ribs. Um, there should be a nice waist from the side and from the top. So scientifically, this is clearly the most important thing um, mm -hmm. for increasing the chance of developing arthritis. Um, and if they develop arthritis, <clears throat> the symptoms are much, much <clears throat> um, less significant. So then when it comes to weight loss, um, it's 80 to 90% about decreasing the calories in. Um, so <clears throat> going on a diet or making sure that they're not getting too many calories. And then only 10 to 20% is really about the activity or the calories burned. Um, unfortunately, that's the same for people too. Like if you're ever trying to like track calories in or out, it's depressing how much you have to work out to, to burn like 
<laughs> a cookie. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Okay. So weight, weight management, single most important thing. Nobody likes to hear it, but it is, there's nothing else that's more important. Um, but then the, the kind of the next category is activity. So what activity should dogs be doing? What's good and what's not good. So what is not good is being a couch potato. So mm -hmm. in the old days, I think people say, oh, oh, dogs have arthritis. They should just, you know, take it easy on their joints and not do too much. That is completely wrong. We actually want dogs to be active. Um, we want them to go for regular walks, meaning ideally every day. Um, swimming is great. So low impact, regular controlled activity. So which is really just going to be a lot of a lot of walking. What we don't want dogs to do that have any sort of joint disorders, or arthritis, is high impact. What that mostly means is jumping. So especially jumping down. Um, if a dog has any elbow dysplasia or elbow arthritis, jumping down is so much pressure on their on their joints. You want to avoid that. This is the other one that people hate to hear, but it's <clears throat> it's it's true. Is playing fetch. So that running as fast as they can and stopping to to catch a ball is really tough on the joints. Um, so, you know, this is the conversation that I have a lot with my clients. If your dog lives to play fetch and lives to chase the ball, we're not going to say, okay, they can't do that anymore. It means that we're going to have to be a lot more aggressive with our pain management. We're going to have to have different expectations that, yeah, your dog's probably going to limp a little bit more and maybe they shouldn't play fetch for quite as long as, as they would like to. You have to be a little bit of the, of the, um, bad guy in, in sense that say, all right, you're only allowed to play for five minutes and then we have to cut it short. So mm -hmm. reducing the high impact activity, regular walk. So there was actually a study that showed that dogs with hip arthritis that walked 60 minutes or more a day had less symptoms than dogs that walked less than 20 minutes a day. Um, oh, that's huge. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a really cool study. But the important thing is now I don't want everybody to go out there and say, all right, I've got to start taking my dog for an hour walk every day. We saw yeah. this. The, it is going. It's like we're going for a walk. No, we saw this in the early days of the pandemic as people were like, I've got all this time. We're going to take my dogs for all these walks. And dogs were coming in that were having all these all these kind of new injuries that they weren't ready for it yet. So you want to build up to that 45 to 60 minute walk. <laughs> okay. So Jenny, just a little one. Uh, <laughs> now, what about... Um, Water therapy, like underwater treadmills and things like that. I love yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. So kind of rehabilitation, physical rehabilitation that generally includes um, underwater treadmill, laser therapy, CC loop, all of that is going to be really helpful from a pain management standpoint. And then also strengthening the muscles. So initially I talked about the muscle atrophy that usually comes along with, with arthritis. Underwater treadmill and swimming is a great way to build up the muscles. It's a great way to um, keep those joints moving without that high impact on the joints. But it is not essential. Um, so you don't have to have rehab. You don't have to have an underwater treadmill. The basics of walking and weight management are, are really the fundamentals. But the icing on the cake, and everybody loves icing. So if you can get to rehab, it's, it's definitely going to be helpful. Right. Uh, right. I don't want to scare everybody that uh, you have to go to a specialist. You have to oh, go yeah, to no. like, no, no. And this, the point, I think a big lesson that I've learned is, is diagnosing so much earlier in the dogs. So yeah. that way we can change some things. Or if there are some surgical options to do as they're younger, I don't want to say get it over with, but get it over with so that they don't get arthritis. Yes. Yeah. Because you don't want to wait. Like, I'm going to tell you, I was, I was, I was really bad. I was, uh, so my Samoyed, I have a picture of her, that dog. Okay. So she had basically a cauliflower for a hip joint and I was just, and I'm a vet and I was like, oh, well, I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. And so I needed to, she, not me, she needed hip surgery. I was not going to do that. Uh, meaning perform it. Uh, and so I just, I actually procrastinated a little bit and then her uh, bad leg started to atrophy so much. So when they did the surgery that was required, she had a, a FHO done. So um, it, the, the muscle is required to be like her new joint. And she had like the spaghetti leg basically. And so I kind of, I think I should not have waited so long. To yeah. Have the surgery done. Like, yeah. so sometimes the sooner the better. Yeah. That's a really good point. I, I think especially with hips, it it's tricky because, Many, many, many dogs with hip arthritis and hip dysplasia will never need surgery. 
um, if you do all of the other things. But mm. there's, there's also a subset. So my last lab, my lab, she wound up, um, she actually had a hip replacement, but I was teetering between FHO and hip replacement only because I got a very big discount where I was working, did we, to the hip replacement? <laughs> um, but yeah, I think you, you do everything you can to avoid surgery, but you don't want to wait too long because you're exactly right. Especially with an FHO, you need that muscle mass to, to help recover. Right, right. Oh my gosh. So I want to talk first, before we get to some of these questions, because they've been zooming in. This is, yeah. by the way, our most live attended session. <laughs> um, so tell me a bit about, like, you really love, I don't want to say you love arthritis, but this is your thing. It is It is my thing. It's, uh, you know, and I think it became my thing because my own dog, I've gone through it with my own dogs. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we've, we've talked about this, uh, how, how much our own dogs impact how we practice as veterinarians. But my first lab, Bella, she um, had hip dysplasia, hip arthritis, and you know everything that I learned from her. She's um, you know no longer with me. It's been a number of years now. But Beans, who uh, she may make an appearance here, she's my 13 and a half year old French bulldog who also hip, has hip dysplasia and hip arthritis. Um, I had a dog Bailey, and so I've gone through so much of it personally. And then as a as a surgeon and a rehab specialist, my my career, my job has really been to bridge the two. So you know, I do orthopedic surgery, but I also see rehab patients and, and, and arthritis really is the condition that kind of bridges between the two. So yeah, it's, it, I guess it's my thing. <laughs> it's, your, it's your thing. Yeah. I love it. So when did you start this website? So CARE was started um, and it was launched officially to the public in August of 2019, but we mm -hmm. started kind of the writing process and putting it together two years ago uh, this week, actually. So it's been out for about a year and a half and there's um, we've got almost 5,000 uh, members um, between veterinarians and, and pet owners. Um, and it's, it's free. So whether you're a veterinary professional, a vet tech, um, you know, as a veterinarian or a technician, you sign up um, because you, you get access to some different information that's basically written towards the veterinarian mm -hmm. Pet owners. You just go on the website and, and click around. And click around. Right. I happen to be there. My little article. So yes, of course. And so and you know, it's not just me. So I started with writing the stuff, but we have a number of amazing specialists and mm -hmm. guest contributors that, you know. I love it. Just like you. I love it. Okay. So I'm gonna hit some of these questions. Uh, let me put my little scroll bar because we've got a ton. And by the way, so many people from all over the world, even from Ecuador. A lot from California, South. Somebody from South Florida, where I'm at, and uh, you're over there in, on the West Coast. So, um, uh, let's see. Let me get down to the questions here. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo, and, and some of them we might have hit. Uh, I know it's hard to see them in pain. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Wait a minute. So, oh my God, the girl on the left looks like my twin. Am I on the left or is? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Wait, I think I'm on the left on my screen, but I don't know if it's turned around. <laughs> uh, okay, so she's doing okay. Uh, I was crushed to know my girl had it, and she's just six, so I'm assuming arthritis. Her vet said it's likely hereditary, mm -hmm. so probably the thing that brought it on was hereditary. Mm -hmm. Now, just a quick question. So the cats. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I know this is an arthritis discussion here, but yeah. the cats, that was very interesting that they're more like us. Oh, we just get it, right? Like, it's, Yeah, it's, it's kind of just an aging wear and tear on the joints. But there was a, more, a recent study that showed that 91% of cats have arthritis. So basically most cats, the older they get, they're going to have arthritis. And that, and that's not because they have hip dysplasia or something. Else. This not is necessarily, just yeah. They, they can just develop arthritis. And... Yeah, they're worth a whole other discussion because they're trickier to to diagnose for sure. I can't even imagine. Okay, uh, my dog always wants me to rub her legs, and I do because it makes her feel feel better. That he has. So, what about like massage? Yeah, so massage um, makes you feel good, right? So, what massage uh, does is it helps bring in blood flow to an area, and it may be able to reduce some of the muscle spasms. So what happens if this joint is arthritic and talk about some of the muscle atrophy around the joints? 
um, the muscles will also start to kind of go into a spasm and massage can potentially reduce some of that muscle spasm, but mostly it just kind of feels good. And you know, when you like bump your elbow and you just kind of do that, you know, yeah. rub it to feel a different sensation. So massage can sometimes trick the spinal cord and trick the brain to feel something good rather than feeling the aches that come with, mm. with arthritis. So yes, massage is great. I love it. Okay. Um, so Cindy said, let me see, she took her pup less than a year old for a swim lesson. The therapist told me my dog would have arthritis when she's older. This was based on her massaging my pet in the water. Um, I guess I would say that there are a number of very, very, very well meaning people out there that are water, like massage therapists that do water therapy with, with dogs. Um, they're not veterinarians. So if there's any concern, then I would talk to your veterinarian. Um, yeah. but you know, it, they are, you know, massage therapists that do water therapy that are experienced with seeing dogs. They may be feeling something that in their experience, um, does think them think that they're going to lead to to arthritis. So I would say if that's a, at all a question, talk to your veterinarian about it. Yeah, for sure. We got a lot of weight questions. We got a, Michelle's got a 15 year old mixed breed and my six year old Akita has it. Akita could stand to lose 15 pounds. <laughs> this is, this is, I, I had my Doberman that's the picture there. And he was, he was on the slim side. Like I always like to try to keep my dogs on the slim side yeah. um, because I'm always so worried. And people would say to me, your dogs are too skinny because I think we are now accustomed to seeing exactly. tubular dogs. Yeah. They should not be. Yeah. They right. Do. Like you see a little waist. You should see a waist. The other thing is you should be able to feel the ribs. Like if you run your finger over the, the top of your hand and you can feel each bone in your hand, yeah. That's how it should feel when you run your hands over the side of a dog and feeling their ribs. And just gently rubbing, not digging in, trying Absolutely. to find it. Yeah, I know. You should easily be able to feel and count each rib. If you're doing this, like over your knuckles. <laughs> that's, that's not, you're yeah. amazing. Just kidding. Yeah. That's yeah. Just, but if you have to push to feel the ribs, that's that's too much. And if you don't see a nice waist from the side and from the top, that's that's. Okay. Listen, I'm not, I, I'm not, I have another dog who's like six and he's stealing Sam's food because she's like has issues. So he's a, he's got a pass right now, but he needs to get, but we walk three miles every day. That's awesome. um, uh, so her, Lori's got a dog that needs to lose eight pounds. Uh, so, so just somebody has some heart issues. So they can't do the, to the surgery. Um, so what about, so there's a lot of people that, that purchase pets from breeders mm -hmm. and they, you know, will like their breeder will say, oh, he's got the, the mother and father. Like, is there any good tips on if somebody wants to purchase from a breeder? Um, you know, I think the, the breeders are going to try and, and, and reduce, um, hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia. Those are the main ones, but they, you know, they have not fully eliminated. Um, if they had, you know, we, none, we would be dealing with this. Um, the, for hips, the, the best thing is to look for, have a veterinarian that palpates for Ortolani um, and for a, do a pen hip exam, which is a, a type of x-ray that is much better than a, a traditional OFA x-ray at diagnosing hip dysplasia. So if you can find a breeder that does pen hip exams for mm -hmm. hips, mm -hmm. that's going to be great. Um, but you know, it's, it's tough because I see a lot, I see a lot of Labradors, um, um, and there's a lot of big breeders around my area out here. And I think the breeders really do their best, but there's still some cases that, that, you know, still develop it. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would say, do your research, talk to the breeders and see what, you know, what the parents are like, but it's never a guarantee, never a guarantee. Yeah, never. So Crystal says limp, limping, usually kneecap issue. No, at least a small breed. Limping. Well, limping could be anything. I would say limping is a sign of pain. Um, so it means you can see your veterinarian. Skipping, that's often the, the patella luxation. But like a, a just a limp, that's yeah. usually going to be a cruciate ligament tear. If we had to just generalize or, or guess, it's going to be yeah. that until otherwise. I'm going to tell you, man, uh, luxating patellas used to give me the EBGBs. <laughs> when I feel them, I'm like, ah! Yeah. <laughs> I feel, like I feel so bad. Um so I see a lot of questions about uh, um, da uh, glucosamine. Mm -hmm. So and there's not 
very good research. Well, the, all of the research out there in dogs and in humans has been really um, not been able to show that glucosamine does much. Uh, so I, I don't give glucosamine to my dogs. Um, I don't think it's worth it. Um, but if you're going to, again, make sure it's a product that has um, independent testing. It's been tested by a third party lab. Okay. There, I'll tell you the supplements that I give. So Movoflex is the one that I give my dog right now. Yeah. Um, Flexidin Advanced is the other one that I recommend. Okay. So yeah, somebody asked about Movoflex. So mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Um, Jenny says, is it given that a 14 year old has arthritis? No, not necessarily. Yeah. A 14 year old cat? Yes. A 14 year old dog? No, not necessarily. <laughs> my girl Sam, she, you know, she didn't, she doesn't have arthritis. She's got cancer in her spine, which is totally yeah. different, but her, like she's yeah. fine. So, um, so don't, don't just assume, right. But you're right. Right. Cats and us. Yeah. <laughs> it, what about salmon oil, fish oil, stuff like that? Yeah. Um, great question. So I, I, I kind of glossed over that, but yes. Um, Omega three fatty acids, fish specifically from fish oil, um, is good so it's a it, it becomes a, an, an anti-inflammatory and we've heard about it for for us for cardiovascular disease and kind of decreasing systemic inflammation or the whole body inflammation fish oil is definitely good i personally don't recommend salmon oil just for sustainability reasons so i think it's better mm -hmm. to get um you know their sardines herring um some sort of small cold water fish is the source um but yes omega-3 fatty acids are great Okay, great. Uh, I should put the caveat there. If you're going to start omega-3 fatty acids, and there's a lot of a uh, lot of papers on this on the CARE website, um, you have to gradually introduce the omega-3s or else you will 100% guaranteed give your dog diarrhea. So over three weeks or so, gradually introducing the fish oil or it will definitely cause diarrhea. I did not know that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. Okay, Sam. <laughs> no, I um, okay, let me see. I'm just trying to, to see if I've caught most of them. Uh, do, 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 do. There was a question about CBD. Are we allowed to talk about that? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So I do. I do recommend CBD. Um, I live in a state that it's legal for every, every reason. Um, but uh, there are certain states and there are certain countries where it's a uh, the conversation is different, um, whether veterinarians are allowed to have it or not. Um, so there is a lot of emerging research to show that CBD, um, has, a, a lot of effects on pain, um, a lot of effects on a variety of different things and systems in the body, but pain in particular, and there's some pretty good research coming out. Um, the product that I recommend is called Elevet. Um, that's mm -hmm. the one that does have some good studies out of, uh, Cornell university. So, um, yeah, with, again, really important, real, even more important, I think, with, with CBD. Um, so CBD is a component of hemp. Um, hemp is uh, different than the marijuana plant. But you want to make sure that, that that sourcing, again, from that hemp and that CBD is um, ideally organic and that every single batch, every single, whether it's a treat or a, an oil, is tested for um, heavy metals and toxins and um, you know uh, mold because those things can show up and um, you don't want to mm -hmm. give that to your dog. So you want to make sure that it's a trusted product. So if, right. if you want to give a random other one that there's a million products out there, make sure you ask the the manufacturer for a certificate of analysis. Um, if they mm -hmm. can give you a certificate of analysis. Um, you probably won't know what to read through it, but it's it, what it means is that they are testing for lead. They're testing te testing for mercury. They're testing for mold. So that's important to look for. All right. So you can't just go to like your local green market and pick it up. Like it it it, it may be okay, but yeah, I would I would maybe side eye it. Yeah. Um, so Jenny's kind of got an interesting question. Is this reversible? Great question. No. Yeah. Um, so. Arthritis is not reversible. It's not curable. Um, it is gen it's progressive, but it is very, very manageable, um, especially if, if caught early. Yeah. Cause she's got, she's got a dog that's that knuckles. So we've got probably other issues going on. And I think what her treadmill might be really good for. Yeah. And, and I think the, again, I, I don't want the point to be missed that arthritis is the number one cause of chronic pain in dogs. And chronic pain is a very common reason for euthanasia, as you very well know. So 
making sure that you're working with your veterinarian about having the pain component dealt with, um, making sure that you know, you're identifying whether your dog is in pain and being really proactive about that. I know. So like I'm on some Facebook groups and I try to uh, try to just sit in the background sometimes, but I, I'll see some, some owners like, I don't want to put them on any medication. So I have them on some like CBD oil. Yeah. Like, it, it, that, I struggle with that. Yeah, I, I really do too. Um, so again, trying to, to understand that pain is, you know, it's, it's different for everyone, but pain sucks. Um, and pain leads to death. Um, in humans, it leads to disability and it leads to depression. Um, I had to mm-hmm. euthanize my last dog because I couldn't keep him painful. Uh, sorry, I couldn't manage his pain. Mm-hmm. I couldn't keep him comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was because I started too late. I, I waited too late to, to start giving him the actual medication. And by that point, his systems had already started getting where he was having spontaneous nerve firing. And um, the spinal cord literally will change so that it becomes easier to feel pain. Um, yeah. So you have to start early. Uh, I know there's there's reluctance because of <clears throat> um, some bad press about certain medications around the liver and the kidneys it's really, really uncommon to have side effects, um, especially if it's used, these medications are used properly. Yeah. I, I, I just, I, I, I get so sad when I see that on, on websites and there, and then, you know, on Facebook groups or something, cause I'm like, Oh, we could, we could help. Yeah. Um, so, uh, oh, so, so Tara, Tari's got 13 year old lab. She's like Gabapin, Adequan, Dasequin, Novo, mm-hmm. Nova, career end. Her rear end, when she stands, slowly falls yeah. to the ground, like she can't yeah. stand. Her muscles. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's? Do you think that's arthritis or something else? It's a very good chance it's arthritis. It, yeah, I mean, I can't make a diagnosis without seeing a right, doctor. Right. Or, you know, it sounds like symptoms that would be consistent with with arthritis, but it could be a neurologic condition also. See now, you know how like arthritis is your thing a little bit more. Like me, because I've had my laryngeal paralysis dog, and I've got Sam, and like this like the, the neuro- neurological things and the knuckling, like I just did mm-hmm. some of that too. And, and, uh, Oh, it's so sad. Um, so physical therapy, hi from Kentucky, New Jersey supplements. Oh my gosh. Just try to think we've got, this is like our most active uh, <laughs> chat here. I think everybody's chatting with each other a little bit. So that's good. Um, what about ice packs? Yeah, that? absolutely. Yeah, so ice is a great, great, great anti-inflammatory and pain reliever. Um, and so I do recommend icing after activity. So so we talked about the dog that lives to play ball and lives to play chase. So after doing that activity, it should come in an ice pack. And ideally, ideally, you're ice packing for 15 to 20 minutes. That's a long time in dog time. So if you can get five minutes, that's great. So you get an ice pack, like a, those flexi blue ones, don't use bags of corn or peas. You'll hear people say that it's you can, but there's so much air trapped in there that it doesn't get as cold as you'd like it to be. So either get a commercial ice pack or you can make your own with two parts water and one part alcohol, double Ziploc bag it, put it in the fridge, sorry, put it in the freezer and it will make a nice moldable consistency. Never, never, never put the ice pack directly in contact with the skin. So you always need to wrap it with like a dish towel or a pillowcase. Then let's say we're talking about the elbow. You wrap it around the elbow and then put an ice bandage around it. Yeah. Adding that additional compression with the bandage helps helps the function of the ice. So, yes, ice is great. That was a good question. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Listen, I think Jenny's going to burst if I don't ask this. She has a good <laughs> question weather and then below it she's asking about barometric pressure so yeah so this is it's a great question um that has virtually no research in dogs um because it's really hard to to track but certainly i know in my my dogs and my patients people will say that with you know when it's going to rain or when the barometric pressure um drops that they'll be more achy and they're more sore so the when we're talking about chronic pain Nobody is able to identify that better than the dog owner themselves. So when they, if they notice that their dog is, seems a little bit more sore or a little more stiff or their personality changes, they may seem more just sad or dull or depressed that may correlate with the weather. And at that time, you know, that's certainly a time where maybe you don't need to give pain meds every day, but at that point in time you do. Um, 
it kind of goes along with it. There, there's often flare ups of arthritis. So you, mm -hmm. a lot of times we'll have patients that don't need to be in a, on an anti-inflammatory every day. Um, we've gotten to the point where they're at an appropriate weight, they're on Anacon, they're doing regular exercise, but then they have a flare up and then we give an anti-inflammatory for a period of time there. So I see that with weather and with kind of just who knows why, but these flares. Yes. Listen, there are, we can, I could have you here forever. Um, and, and, and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so many questions. So this is, this is awesome. One other little suggestion or it was a question is, um, which I like is that, the the, the nails, like so many people don't cut their nails. I know this is not like, I know it, there's so many, what about Rimadyl? What about this? But yeah. like sometimes these little things people forget about. Yeah. I mean the home environment. So you and I were talking about this earlier. So making sure that those hardwood floors and tile floors are covered with yoga mats, covered with rugs um, and the nails are trimmed short. So again, this is one of the things that if you start early when the dog's a puppy or a young dog, keeping their nails short, getting them trained to allow you to dremel them or cut them. It's going to help you so much when they become older and they're having trouble standing up. So cover the hardwood floors, keep the nails trim. I love it. And you are, you're a fan of acupuncture therapy, lasers. Of course we did yeah. yes, yeah. lasers. We did a whole Facebook live last month on it. Like, yes. Yep. Yeah. I don't do acupuncture myself, but um, I've got two colleagues that I work with that do it. So I certainly do recommend it. Um, yeah. yeah, I I love it. All right, is there anything I forgot to mention? Oh boy, uh, I mean there there honestly is so much more. Um, we didn't really talk about surgery or anything like that. I would just um, say you know again the highlights are look for it early. Um, mm -hmm. So signs of pain, I think that would be the last one. Is like how do you know mm -hmm. if your dog's in pain? So number one, limping is a sign of pain. Um, your dog just doesn't want to do things that they may have wanted to do in the past, or they don't get up to greet you when you come home. They don't get out of their bed. They don't seem to want to go for a walk or on the walks are kind of lagging behind. Um, they don't seem interested in sniffing when they're out on the walk. They're just kind of focused on like, Oh my God, this hurts. Are they going to make me go any further? Um, licking excessively of an area. So this is a huge misconception that people think that if dogs are licking their front of their paw here, it must either be that they've got obsessive compulsive disorder or they've got a, neuro, uh, a dermatological disorder. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that they may not have that, but there's also a really good chance that they have pain in their elbow and their shoulder or they have a bulging disc in their neck. And it's causing this, this kind of prickly feeling in their arm. So it's called referred pain. And licking is a soothing mechanism that dogs use to try and soothe themselves. So that's a sign of chronic pain. So... There's a questionnaire on the canineanarthritis.org website about, um, you know, is my dog in pain? So you can go through and see a lot of these different questions. Um, you know, do they sleep through the night or are they restless? Yeah. I know. And listen, there are a lot of lab lovers on this. Uh, and, and labs just really don't have ever a bad day. Like they, they're they just such, they have the joy gene, which yep. so many people, oh, he's wagging his tail, he's eating, he's not in pain. And I see yeah. them. I, I always see like that that front limping too, and, and yeah. like a head bop. And I always I think of equine medicine when we're like down and sound. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. And, I mean, I'm I'm a lab person, true and true. Um, and so I agree. You know, if they miss a meal, something really, really is wrong. So you have to. You, looking for pain and arthritis is subtle, but you know, you know your dog better than anyone else. So mm -hmm. if you think that something is off, or if they're limping, there's you know they need to be checked out by a vet. Yes, I, I agree. Okay, so I want to thank you so much. Uh, I think this is probably one of, like I said, our most watched live. Uh, and I want to thank everybody who listened. And if you have any suggestions about what you want to see, also put it in there. But I want to just put your website one more time on there, the canine arthritis. Or, and, you know, um, thank you so much for being such an advocate for for this for this topic, for this, you know, disease and and being a an awesome teacher for me <laughs> and you are what areas do you service because there might be people out in the pacific northwest that could come to you if you needed well um actually i'm leaving practice this is brand new information um, oh, what? uh yeah i i'm not seeing any new patients and i'm leaving practice next month uh i was offered a position as the pain specialist for 
I can't say it yet, but the largest animal health company in the world. I know what that <laughs> is. I know where you're going. Okay, well, that is, they're very lucky and what a perfect role for you. But um, uh, actually, is there what, for, for an orthopedic surgeon, where should people go? I mean, they're, they're regular, their primary care doctor can know one locally. So it's, yeah. it's a beautiful thing. Um, so um, the American College of Veterinary Surgeons. Um, yeah. So if you go to the website, I believe it's acvs.org. There's a link from the CARE website to find a surgeon. Um, so there's a link to find a surgeon. There's a link to find a rehab vet. Um, so it'll take you to the website so you can find a surgeon in your area, a board certified surgeon um, and a, a rehabilitation trained veterinarian. Nice. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Everybody's saying thank you and great presentation. And I know this is super, super helpful. And, and it is it is the biggest thing we see here at, at Lap of Love is arthritis. And, and I feel like we see them when we could have helped. And so sometimes it's 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 years prior could have helped or like you said, starting when they're young. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again so much. And My pleasure. Good luck on your new job. <laughs> All right. Take Bye. care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.